the next speaker, he's um, Rich Archbold, is a senior director of engineering at Intercom, where his team builds software that powers more than 450 million conversations for more than 1 billion end users. And prior to that, he held engineering roles at Facebook and Amazon. And he will share one of the topics that's a dream of all of us business people, how to run less software. Thank you very much for joining us, Rich. Thank you very much. Hey, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for having me today. It is absolutely wonderful to be here. It is my first time in Romania. Uh, my name is Rich. I'm a senior director of inter I'm a senior director of engineering at a, at an Irish startup called Intercom. Uh, Intercom, for anybody who doesn't know who we are or what we do, you probably encountered us over the last couple of days. If you're looking on the Techsylvania website, you'll see in the bottom right-hand corner there is a little chat bubble which is powered by Intercom, and. What actually we do, our mission is to make business personal, and we do that by providing a B2B SaaS uh, customer communication platform. And that, that enables our customers to have real and meaningful conversations and relationships with their customers. Now, as a startup, we're actually doing pretty well. We are about seven years old. Uh, we have raised about $240 million in venture funding. We have about 20,000 paying customers. Uh, in total, those customers talk to about 1 billion end users every month, and about 450 million new conversations are initiated on our platform every month. And today, one of the things I want to talk to you all about is one of the things we, we think is a secret of our success, which is an engineering and product development strategy called uh, Run Less Software. Now, for me, uh, uh, when I was actually putting this talk together, I was working with a fantastic speaking coach called Patrick. And Patrick asked me, Rich, how do you want people to feel or think as you're actually giving this presentation? And I said, Patrick, for me, I think the world is a little bit dark and scary at the moment, and it is a potentially dangerous, perilous place to be as a technology and business entrepreneur, but I actually think there is hope in the world. Uh, and Patrick said to me, Rich, uh, are you giving a tech talk or are, you, or are you actually trying to write some sort of a horror movie or a thriller movie? And I said, a little bit of both, to be honest with you. And he thought I was crazy and paranoid, and so what I did was I got up at a whiteboard and I started to draw out this kind of battlefield. And I said, Patrick, I think there's actually a war going on out there today. I think, there, I think so much of the... So much of the technology, business, and product landscape is so, so, so competitive, and uh, not everybody realizes it, and not everybody realizes all of the battles which are going on, all of the armies in the field, what their strategies are, and if you don't actually realize you're in a battle, it is going to be very hard for you to win. And at this stage, Patrick was like, going, Rich, you're crazy, you're paranoid, you're actually going to have to explain this one a little bit to me. Uh, in order to convince me that you are right. And so I started to go through all of these people on the battlefield, and I said, the first, the first army on the battlefield is us, Intercom. We are the naive, hopeful, ambitious little startup who, who think we have this really great business idea and we are actually trying to win in our market. But the second group of people on this battlefield are copycats. This, these are people who, who have seen our business idea and are trying to beat us at our own game. And it has never been a better time to be a copycat. And the reason I say this is that traditional, traditional barriers into markets are evaporating. Money is cheap and basic execution is easy. And when I say money is cheap, interest rates are at an all-time low. If your business idea is in any way credible, or better yet, if your business idea is to copy my business idea, which is, which is already relatively successful, you have a reasonably good chance of getting funding. Basic execution is becoming easy as well. If you think about it, with the advent of cloud computing and all of the wonderful modern tools we have today, infrastructure as a service, software as a service, platform as a service, soon to be like ser uh, serverless, 
all of the different software frameworks, Ruby on Rails, Angular, Iconic, you name it, it is now becoming so easy for a relatively small group of engineers to, to build a really working, a really credible working copy of your fantastic product, which you, which you sweated over for years and years. They can build a working version of it in a few weeks or months with simply only a uh, credit card email address and a small number of developers. So all of this for me means that's kind of scary. I actually have a pretty serious threat beside me. Then I think of the third army on the battlefield, and this is actually the army of talent. It's us. We are the soldiers, and nobody can win a war without soldiers. Right now, there is a war for talent ongoing. Demand outstrips supply three to one. For every three tech jobs out there, there is only one person applying for it, which is great for us. It gives us a lot of choice, but uh, not so great for companies who are maybe lower down the pecking order trying to make their way in the world. And then the fourth army on the battlefield is probably the most interesting and scary one for me, and this is the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Amazon, Apple, Google, and Facebook. And they are just so disruptive in all of these wars. They compete and disrupt on so many different levels. First of all, they see the war for talent and compete in it directly against all of us. And it is hard to compete against Amazon, Apple, Google, and Facebook. I know I used to work for them. I understand all the tools. You have probably better salary, better stock options, better security, all of the cool toys to play with, and that's that, that's actually a super compelling value proposition. They also actually see the war on talent, war for talent, and compete in it in this kind of really disruptive way. I talked about infrastructure as a service, software as a service, platform as a service, serverless. They just, they just keep providing new tools and services which raise the abstraction line higher and higher and higher. And on the one hand, you can say this is great. It helps us all to build more stuff more quickly. But if you aren't alive to it, what you can find is that the things that, that, that you earn a salary today are slowly but surely getting commoditized and abstracted away. And if you're not careful, you could find yourself redundant. I believe in our lifetime, there will be engineering as a service, and designers and PMs will uh, rule the world. Uh, and you may all think I'm crazy paranoid at this stage, but I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to talk through a couple of examples, and maybe I might actually convince you that some of this isn't quite so paranoid. Uh, so the first battle I want to talk about is Slack versus HipChat. And hopefully everybody knows who Slack and HipChat are. For me, HipChat were one of the uh, earliest companies to do modern team messaging really, really well, and they were super successful at it. But Along came Slack, and they decided they were going to try and come into this market, and they did, and here is what happened. They started doing it so well, they've now completely dominated the market, and uh, HipChat and Asana and the other players are uh, on their way quickly to losing this battle. The second battle I want to use as an example is Instagram versus Snapchat. So Instagram were the, or Snapchat were this innovative startup coming along to disrupt social, network, social networking, and they were doing it a little bit too well, and Mark Zuckerberg and Instagram took note, and they started to say, hey, that Snapchat stories thing you have seems to be earning you a lot of money. We think we are going to do it too. And they started to do it, and where we are today is Snap is seen as a dead stock walking. Uh, now, for me, I don't ever want to be seen as a dead stock walking, so... Uh, I think that's a battle they are definitely losing. And the last battle that I'm actually going to talk about today is uh, probably the saddest one for me. So this is Blue Apron against Amazon, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. So for anybody who doesn't know what Blue Apron are, they are a meal kit company. So they provide you with recipes and ingredients, send them out to your door, enable you to cook a wonderful meal. So. Uh, this is fun. So they were doing so well. Amazon announced, or Amazon didn't even announce anything. They actually just registered a trademark indicating they might go into the business. Uh, and Blue Apron stocks tanked. Amazon actually did go into the business and started to do really well. And then one month after Blue Apron's IPO, they had to announce 
uh, layoffs. 1,200 people lost their job as a result of this. So this is like the scariest one of all. Uh, some real life examples uh, which I think prove uh, maybe I'm just about paranoid enough. Time is short, opportunities are fleeting, money is cheap, basic execution is easy, talent is scarce, and the threat from one of the four is real. So how do you win, and what the hell has it got to do with run less software? Uh, in the matrix, Neo is able to beat a more powerful foe. And the way he does it is he is able to perceive time more quickly, which gives him the ability to see, understand, decide, and act more quickly than his more powerful foe, and thus defeat him. Now, uh, hopefully this isn't the matrix. I took the red pill this morning, so I think I'm okay. Uh, uh, and certainly I'm not smart or handsome enough to be Neo. But I think his general strategy is actually pretty good. I think this idea of uh, the way you win is by wielding time more efficiently and uh, enabling you to just move faster and faster continuously, uh, more faster than all of your competitors. Um, and for me, as engineers, what that means is that our, that our time is best spent when, when we are focused on only the most important things, only the things that really matter to our business, only the things that really create enduring competitive advantage. And that's, and that's, that's kind of basically the philosophy or thinking behind run less software. Uh, my fonts got a little bit crazy here. Um, but run less software for us has three pillars. Save time by choosing standard technologies save time by outsourcing undifferentiated heavy lifting, and spend all of that save time wisely only on, your, only on doing things which create enduring competitive advantage. So let's talk a little bit about that first one, choosing standard te technologies. And I've been using battlefield analogies from the start. I'm gonna stick with it now a little bit. Uh, this, this idea of choosing standard tooling has, has been around for ages. There has always been many, many different weapons that uh, people can choose to train with, but they would never bring all of their weapons into battle with them. They would only pick one or two and specialize on them. And uh, that is exactly what choosing standard technologies is to us. It's we constrain ourselves to using only a very small opinionated set of tools and by using these over and over and over again, we become experts uh, in them, and we are able to move really, really, really quick, quickly with them. If this sounds similar to Dan McKinley from Etsy's choosing boring technology, it is, it is really similar. If anybody hasn't seen it, I strongly encourage you to read his blog and watch his talks. Uh, in it, he has this wonderful mathematical equation where he says the total cost of, of any engineering decision is equal to the operational costs which arise from the decision minus the velocity benefits you get from the decision. And for us, when we choose standard technologies, we believe that we get uh, the lowest cost engineering decisions with the biggest velocity, uh, biggest velocity benefits. This here eye chart is like an example of all of the lessons learned we've, we, we've made over the seven years of our existence, all of the hard-fought decisions, uh, errors made, and we have a list of, sta of 10 standard technologies there. And the point here is the technologies are not right or wrong. The point is that we have made a decision. And if you look at the other side, there is a bunch of perfectly great technologies that any of you could decide to use. Uh, it doesn't matter which ones you use. It just matters that you make a decision. The astute amongst you may have noticed that a bunch of our technologies are Amazon AWS services. And that leads me nicely onto my, la my second point, which is around outsourcing undifferentiated heavy lifting. Peter Drucker, who was born, I think, in 1909, said in 1963, there is surely nothing quite so useless as doing with great efficiency what should never be done at all. Uh, it's super relevant then and it's super relevant now. Jeff 
Jeff Bezos said many years later he reckoned businesses spent 70% of their time on undifferentiated heavy lifting, stuff that's just cost of doing business, and only 30% of their time doing stuff that their customers really cared about. And he wanted to help reverse those things around. Where we are today, we actually measure this stuff a lot, and we are pretty confident that we have almost made that switch. Uh, and we obviously aren't happy there. We actually want to get to 80-20 rather than, rather than being at 60-40. So with all this save time, what do you do? What do you do with it? Uh, Tyler Durgan says the things that you own end up owning you. And so if I look at the things we own there, Ruby and JavaScript, bare metal Elasticsearch, Intercom Nexus, Intercom Messenger, am I happy with those things owning us? Well, Intercom Messenger and Intercom Nexus are our chat widget. Those are the stuff that is absolutely unique to us, so I'm super cool with us owning that. All of the Ruby and JavaScript is used to is used to create our front end, which our customers interact with. I'm totally fine with that as well. The Elasticsearch one, not so much. It's absolutely undifferentiated heavy lifting. However, we have yet to find a really great hosted Elasticsearch company. So if anybody wants a startup idea, if you can build that, I'll certainly buy it. Uh, so that's all of the theory. Let's talk about it in action, see what it looks like. Uh, the most simple example is about four years ago, we used to give our developers complete freedom to choose whichever database they wanted to use. And we had probably half the stuff in MySQL, half the stuff in Postgres. We said, this is like inefficient. It doesn't fit our philosophy. We looked out at the industry, and we picked AWS, uh, RDS, MySQL. We standardized everything on that. And a couple of months later, AWS Aurora came along. And it was such a seamless upgrade for us, and we got a 5x throughput increase at a 30% cost reduction. So this one worked out really well, and the lesson learned is even if you are going to pick very specific technologies, you, you actually need to know everything which is out there in order to be able to make good decisions on which one to use. The next problem uh, was scaling our user storage. So we have over a billion end, end users uh, monthly active on our platform every month, which which results in a huge amount of uh, throughputs to our database. Originally, we built it on MongoDB, and we got to the point of where it was uh, super expensive, and MongoDB wasn't considered standard technology for us. And we tried to build it on, we tried to rebuild it on Aurora, and it wouldn't quite work, and we tried to rebuild it on Dynamo, it wouldn't quite work, two of our standard technologies. Uh, and we thought, maybe we've got to give up and stick with non-standard technology. But what we were able to do was break down the problem into two constituent parts and run half on Aurora and half on MongoDB. And now we have a solution which is uh, natively scalable and is 90% uh, cheaper operationally to run. And the lesson learned here is you need, to be able to, you need to be able to break down big, hairy problems into smaller constituent parts, which can then be solved by your standard technologies. And the last example is one we failed at. Uh, our, uh, our inbox is built three, three different times, once on web, once on iOS, once on uh, Android. Uh, three different teams, three different sets of engineers, three different, so three different sets of software, three different sets of bugs, run more software. And we decided mobile web has come on so fast, we actually want to try and rebuild everything on mobile web, and so we actually went to our mobile engineers and said, here's a strategy. We want to try and rebuild everything on mobile web. And it really upset them. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't actually include them in the decision. Uh, we didn't explain to them how we actually respected their skill sets working in, uh, in the native mobile technologies, and uh, we ended up having to roll back on it. And the lesson learned here for me was that engineering strategy is easy, people and their trust is harder and more important. And so much of what I've talked about is like war, leader, battle, whatever, and really that isn't it. It's, it's, it's all about building a, a wonderful, fun, in, inclusive, diverse teams of problem solvers rather than seeing yourself as a software developer. So I'm almost finished. Uh, what's the prize if you get to do all of this? And the prize is always kind of different for everybody. For, for me, it's like move fast and ship things. 
Uh, we ship code to production about 1,000 times a week, about 200 times a day, fully automated push on green, end-to-end -end test time is about three minutes, end-to-end -end deploy time out to like thousands of instances is about 10 minutes. Uh, and like shipping is so great, it's just, as a product organization, it's just the beginning and end of everything. Uh, the other thing beyond being an engineer is, is, the, biz, is the business end. And if you do it all well, hopefully you get to continue to be a really successful business. And then the last thing, which is like super personal for me, is I want to spend a lot of time with these folks. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. And appreciate the patience with the uh, slight tech problems which we have.